All right. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started. It looks like, you know, uh, participants joining has started to slow down a little bit. So I'll give Emil a quick introduction. Um, so Emil is a software engineer at Posit. If you aren't aware, Posit is the new name of our studio, um, recently rebranded. Um, so Emil is part of the Tidy Models uh, team and in works on improving R's modeling capabilities. He maintains several packages within uh, the realm of modeling, including text analysis and also color palettes. Um, he's been working on trying to make slide crafting a well-respected verb. He's also co-author of the book, Supervised Machine Learning for Text Analysis in R with Julia Silge, which I uh, mentioned and included in the email blast that I sent out, I think yesterday. And today he'll be talking about what's new in Tidy Models. And the Tidy Models framework is a collection of packages for modeling and machine learning using Tidyverse principles. So this talk will touch on a number of new additions and in-process work being done by the team. So without further ado, take it away. All right, thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'll just jump right into it. Uh, yes, all right. So yeah, I'll be talking about what's new. It's as we said, a lot of new, new things with a very broad definition of new. I put some kind of old things that I just wanted to let people know about and some in process and very soon to come things. So tidy models, it's a collection of packages in R that tries to make modeling machine learning easier and easier in like a user friendliness. We want to try to keep you on the happy path throughout the whole modeling framework. Try to use like expressive verbs and names to make it a, a pleasant experience. We're using tidyverse principles, which you can see with things like pipes and names and all of that. Uh, as a general uh, landing page, we have tidymodels.org that has little information about everything we've been doing. All right, so since we're doing modeling, we need to have a little bit of data to talk about. I'm using the movies data set from, from Tattle, which is a very big data set of all these different movies and ratings and metadata and all these various different things. I filtered it down to horror movies and did like quite a lot of modifications to make it work with the slides. Um, I also cheated a little bit because it's really hard to get a themed data set to work for the multiple different things I'm trying to show. So it's I'm cheating with some of the numbers right here, but the general idea is still there. And we have some, some fun um, Halloween inspired data set. And, and we can kind of see here we have, so we're all down to just uh, 10 variables and we have things like the title of the movie. It has an ID, which is just another identifier of what it is. We have how long it is, we have budget, when it released, who, um, like what language is spoken and so on. It's a bunch of little different things. Um, and whenever we do uh, modeling in like a statistical machine learning way, a lot of times we want to do splitting of the data. And this is where I'll talk about the, the first of our new things we did fairly recently, which is proper support for validation splits. So we've seen before how we had like initial split and initial time split and all of that, where we take the data set and split it into a training data set and a testing data set with the whole idea that we run all our models and do the model selection or the training data set. And at the very end of the process, we use the testing data set to find out the performance we expect on the out of sample later. I do. <laughs> that one. So, and but we but our past approach of how people needed to do the validation split ended up being hey 
take your testing training split and then do another split within the training. And it felt a little awkward. So now we have like fall support with the validation split function. So this creates a three-way split. And we can see right here, I'm taking the horror movie. We'll be doing some survival analysis later. So I'm already creating the deserve object right here before doing the split. So it's just available everywhere. And then pass it into initial validation split. There's also a time variant and all the other variants you would expect. And now we did a, a split object that has like the, where they're randomly split into the different sessions. We set a seed because this is a random process to make sure there's not a inherent ordering of the data that spills in. What we'd not to do with this is we can turn this split object into what we call an R set object, which is a similar construct to like a bootstraps uh, output or a cross validation output. So when we, so a lot of times when we do modeling, we might want to like fit the model multiple times to day's performance or do high performance tuning. So we can create like a bootstrap, like 50 different bootstraps. And in the R sample pad hit, that comes out as a tipple of all the splits with an ID. And that object is then used in tuning. But you can also turn your validation split into this same style of object for tuning purposes. So then you have, you can use all the, the tuning infrastructure, but you just have one uh, split object to fit it on instead of, instead of many. And it knows correctly which sets to do it on. And we still can use the, the training, testing, and validation functions to pull out the different parts of the data. So here I'm pulling out the, the training set because that is what we'll be using moving on to do like our feature engineering and fitting the model. So what you might have noticed already, some of these variables are quite messy in the sense that they're not like our typical uh, variables. So in the genre and production countries variable and language spoken to, I didn't add it on the slide. They are comma separated of the different elements. So we can't necessarily treat dummy variables the way we did, like we normally would. But we, we could, and I'm showing that next slide why we don't want to do that, because since the term is separated and we're allowing for arbitrary number of um, like uh, levels in this term is separated list, you can get a lot of combinations. And here I didn't chat, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's also an ordering thing here. So here we are seeing, because I'm seeing here drama, thriller, romance, but here is thriller, drama, mystery. So it's not even ordered. So you also might pull, like you might have thriller and crime and crime and thriller. And technically they're the same, but they would be pushed different ways. So we're seeing just with this low amount, we have over 300 unique uh, genre combinations, which we're dating by just combining 19. And we have to remember the training data set is what? It's it's like, like 2,250. So what, like 15% of, it's, it's a huge amount of like unique values that we should probably encode in a better way than just doing dummy variables. Because this is what we see if we just treat dummy variables like how we normally would. I'm using the recipes package, I love it. It's I think by far the best way of doing feature engineering. Um, so we specify a recipe. And here I'm just doing just working with the genre because it prints better. But I'm saying that the only predictor passing the data and I'm creating dummy variables 
of the genre, a prevet, and then I bait it. So I give me like fit the training, give me the results back. And we are seeing with that better table, the same number of rows, but with that 320 talums. Been touching the talum for each combination, and it has a bunch of it's all zeros instead of like one, one in each row. So it's a very inefficient way of doing it. And here we have like we have the first one's action, the next one action adventure, and action adventure animation, and maybe something else. It looks like, and all of those. Like they are, in my mind, they're related. That if you're action, you should be somehow related to the action adventure. Also, for that to mention, all of these have horror in them as well. I removed it because they are common denominator in all of them. So it was silly to include as well. But here, if there had been a, a one right here, it would be, and a one up here, the model wouldn't be able to realize, hey, these have action in common, which I feel would be a mistake. So this is where we have the, the step dummy extract. Uh, there's a, the, the you can't see, there's a header, there's a footer down here with a link to like when some of these features was added. But yeah, the step dummy extract function takes in like, um, the dummy variable, and then I'm saying specifying the separator argument, and here was Tama separator, so I didn't say Tama space, and it splits up everything, and then counts all the unique things after the splitting. So now we see that like the first one, it has prime, but it also it has prime over here, and it has action. So we touch the first one is prime and action. It, they were one in each. And it's just it's delightful. Like you can do already there. I feel like you find this state, this style of like putting the data in very often. And this is just a delightful way of splitting it up. There's also a you can do it in two ways. You can either do it by separation here. So it splits it up by the separator and you count all the different things. There's also a pattern argument that then extracts all the patterns and then count those depending on how what's easier for you. You might need to use red hats, which I'm sorry, but that is simply just the sadly the easiest way of doing it. We can also we still know here there's 20 columns, but there happens to be 20 unique um things happening right here. There's also a threshold argument in this function. So we are saying you split everything up and then you count all the unique values. And then we are othering everything that appears less than here 10% of the time. So here we just have action, comedy, drama, mystery, science fiction, and thriller. Um, and then Everything else be less than ten percent of the time, so that's being counted up to the other in the other. And it's nice. It's a um, it worked perfectly for what we needed right now, because this seems much better. Now we can see that things are being counted in hopefully a more logical way. Another thing we have in our data set, this is not new at all, but we need to deal with it, is a date variable. You know, to the release date. And that is counted as the number of days since a certain uh, point in time. So if you pass it into a model, it will do one of two things. It will either error, like error out saying, I don't know how to deal with dates, or it will uh, use it as an integer of number of days since a start date. I don't remember exactly which day it is. I think it's 1970, January 1st. And that may be useful, but there's way more things to do with a date than just 
time since beginning of time. So we have the step date, which has a number of pre-built features into it. So you can say, hey, I want the day of the week and the month. And it's not the best nomenclature, but label false turns. Normally this defaults to turn returning the day of the week and the month as factors. But I wanted to do just numbers right here. Here, So we are turning, returning those numbers. And then I'm saying keep original columns to false to uh, delete the release state variable. To the team observer, there is one new thing in here, which is this all date predictor selection function. And that is something fairly new. So that we did that almost a year ago, where we used to have all nominal and all numeric. Um, Selectors and all of these has like all numeric predictors and all non null predictors. And we went ahead and expanded them. So now in your data, when you apply a step, you can now say, I want all the date variables and apply the step to it. Or I want all the date time, which is once that have date and uh, our minute second in it as well. You can also say, I want all the strings, which is specific is a recipe specific nomenclature to mean characters, but not factors. And plus we know it's all characters, but that also it, we like the word string better here. So now you can be much more um, specific about how to apply these transformations without having to resort to the names itself. I know some people like to work with integers differently because they might be integers for a reason. Now we can say all integer predictors and apply a thing to that. And it just works. So these are, these are very nice additions. All right, so we did that. We took in all our data we used the dummy extract on the things that needed it. I did some median, median imputation. It doesn't matter. This isn't a great model. On the bug, it has, had some, it has some missing values in there. And because we had the ID and the title in the data set, we don't want to pass those on into the model because all the values should be unique if we did it right. So they're not predictors. So I'm using the update role and setting the new role to ID. It doesn't really matter what it is as long as it's not predictor or outcome. Because now it will, now those variables will not be sent along as predictors for our model. All right, and we can take a little sneak peek of what it looks like now. So now, if we remember before, it had things. Now it's all numeric variables with no missing values. We dealt with the production time, like sporting language. The sporting language is a little bit weird because the way we set the threshold here, it's basically counting, is it English? But how many times did English appear? And then everything else was ordered. And there's probably a bias in the original data set that, that did that, but it doesn't really matter. This is just a, but we have the data that now is something we can fit into any machine learning model. That's all the variables. There's not even, we all really dealt with all the dummies, no missing values. So this should all fit in whatever. And this is where we get to another new thing that is, it's like a 95% done. So like this is one of the next, in a couple of weeks, this is when we will finish off this and give it a final push up to you people. And you can already see parts of this amount. So this is the idea of survival analysis. And I don't like the, the, the name term survival analysis. I, as much as I can call it time to event data, or it's, like it's right sense of data too. So it's, you're working in a setting where you have some data, where you're looking at how long until something happens. 
And whenever you're working with that type of data, there will be some units where that event haven't happened yet. So uh, the example I like is, is pet adoption. So you have a pet adoption place and you have a bunch of cute little kittens and they will be uh, adopted eventually, but some of them you just got in and they haven't been around long enough, but you want to find out maybe the way we post them online makes a difference on how fast they are adopted. But like maybe if we need, maybe the ones with four pictures adopt faster than one with one, we should add four pictures to all of them. So this is where a lot of time to event data come in because we would like to in include as much information as possible so we can include the data of the kittens that haven't been adopted out yet because we still know that they might have been there for two weeks so we know they at least been there for two weeks we don't know how much longer but it's at least two so that information is still there um if you ignore the censoring part, you get biased estimates. So that you could treat this as a normal regression analysis and people do that, but you would be wrong and you would get a bias in, I don't never remember the right direction, but it would be wrong. That's why we're spending the time with this viral analysis. Um, for this data set, the, the, the event is not great because it's, um, how long did it take for this movie to get 100 ratings? And the time is taken in weeks. And that is done because that's the best I could find. Like I did, in the movie setting, the time to rent would probably be how long until this movie breaks even. Because that is probably what people care about more but that data wasn't available. And you did this weird thing of that is some movies might never break even. So that's like a whole different chain of worms, but it's not great, but it, it's seasonal, so it fits in. And it still demonstrates how we can fit these models. All right, so um, what we have right now is in, uh, we have a parsnip is normally our package to uh, fit models. We have an extension package called sensor that contains the necessary models to turn that uh, time to event uh, models. We have a number of performance metrics that are specific to sensor analysis, and we also have support to fit multiple models. So we're basically all most there. There's some ironing out we need to do of the last little things. We need people to try it more. So of course, if you're interested in any of this or have data like this, please use it and let us know anything. We also have a little bit of documentation left to be done, but most of the pieces are there. We are in a very final push. And a lot of, some of these changes are in the development um, branches to run this code and time it to that something that works. All right. So if you use Parsnip before, then you can fit survival models. You just load up uh, a sensor package alongside tidy models and you specify a model the same way. So here I'm showing how to fit a parametric survival regression model. Uh, so it's survival, survival underscore red. We set a distribution. I set the default, but that you can pick other ones. The engine has multiple engines. I'm using the survival, which is default. And the new mode to facilitate these um, time to event modeling is what we call sensor regression. So you set the mode, and this will complain. You run it if you change them to something that isn't valid. But it's the same as normal parsnip. Now we just introduced a new mode. And we have a, we used one type of model, but 
you can fit this type of data to oh, yeah, that's much that point. Apparently, a bunch of different type of tree models. Where so decision tree, bad tree, boosted trees, bunch of studies in the forest works, and you also have proportional hazards regression. So there's a lot of different things, and all of these have different engines that power the calculations. What really the only thing that really splits apart this time to event data than normal regression is we have the how long we've seen it and then whether the thing happened or not. And I created this very in the bad using the serve function. So I said that we have the time to event, which is the weights, and then I have a variable called target that says um if this particular movie have received um a hundred ratings yet. So it, it so the very so we have two variables. It either says whether it received a hundred ratings or not, and the other one said how long it took to get that hundred rating, or how long we've been waiting so far we haven't hit it yet. And that's the part I had to cheat because the data otherwise didn't look that great. All right, so, um, and then we just, we can combine this into a workflow so we can use also our recipe we created earlier to deal with these uh, non-standard predictors it's all no merit, the model of it, we can just fit it in just once. Um, another thing where it is a little bit different is uh, talking about predictions. So we have time to event setting. So there's a couple of different things we can try to predict and all of these are, we do, do it with the predict function and we set the type argument to different things depending on what we wanna predict. And sometimes you specify the eval times, and we'll see that. So normally, we can predict the time to event prediction. So this is just how long are we predicting that it will take to hit the target? Which here, the numbers don't mean anything because it's a bad model, but this is how we would use it. And this is in wheat, so you say, oh, this one is predicted, the seventh one is predicted to hit a hundred rating in just 300 uh, weeks, but then this one is like 30 fast, which seems like a lot. So that's definitely like something we have in here. Um, we know there's like the linear prediction out. So this is like you, it's a little bit of math to like understand what it is, but if you're in this field, you know what it means. We can also uh, get our quantiles of the event time distribution. So if we said quantile, we kind of we did it back out in this like nested tipple ness to because we need we have the parsnip guarantee that prediction will always trade the same number of rows as the data coming into it. But when we're doing a quantile here, here we want the values for nine different quantiles. We have to nest it in a table to make the word. We can pull them out, we can unnest them, and how we can see like the the quantile pre, uh, prediction of the different quantiles. Um, another thing we can take the survival probabilities out. Uh, for different, so here we have a, a idea of a time point. So the survival probability will depend on at what time. So when we go in here, um. At ten weeks here for this for this first observation, no, for this this first observation, it is predicted to have a ninety two percent survival rate at the ten week mark. So, but the prediction depends on. And when it happens, so here we need to also supply 
the evaluation times that we are specifying. And then those, so that nested tipple because we are predicting multiple things within. And we can also pass it is the same, same spiel as the survival rate. So we have a bunch of different, we have a bunch of different uh, things you can predict with. But we also have some performance metrics that know about that deal with this time to event data. And I link them right here because if you don't, we have hidden them um, in the default documentation. So it's still, they still work, but they are not popping up on the document page, documentation page yet because we're not quite ready yet. But if you're interested, you can still find them and just don't use them. So there are a couple of different metrics that know about. So I think one of them is like uh, the Briar store has a survival variant that we can use. So here I'm using the augment function, which is a great function if you haven't seen it already. It essentially takes prediction of the data set and then binding the tolerance of the original data set back to it. So we have the original data set up here, uh, original data set up here, and then we're adding in the prediction. So here we have a predict time and another prediction. So it adds like information in there. Then some of these metrics require a couple of different things. So this should, this works without this. You don't need to do this normally if you just fit a sensor regression model. If you put it in a wet flow, you have to do this little trick right now. Hopefully we can fix it. But essentially you need a bunch of weights and other things you can estimate from the data. Once you have that in your dot pred object, you can use a lot of the survival metrics out of the box how you did normally. So you set the truth, which is our server object, and then our predictions, which has all the things it needs. And we can calculate like the prior store. So I'll price store here, like you would most other adjusted metrics. And the main thing here is some of these metrics needs quite a lot, but this should um, this work mostly out of the box and we don't fit smooth out the rest in the next couple of weeks, hopefully months. All right, and but we can also fit. If everything still works in tune. So if you set something to be tuned or you want to fit like resamblers to find out what happens, you can also just set everything into a fit what resamples and it knows what to do. And we, um, so here I'm setting some eval times because it needs to know the eval times to calculate the Briar store within each. So here we fit our survival model in a workflow on the validation set that it happens once and then it calculates the prior store on these different time points. And so it just it basically just fits within our tune workflow. All right. Another thing that isn't as new but is it's it sort of is also a new way of doing modeling, a different way of doing modeling. So is the project I've been working very heavily on is steady of clustering. So it's when you have data, but you don't have an outcome. So it's that you just have a bunch of predictors that has information in them, hopefully. And you want to see, can I split this data into multiple? Um, but does it partition well? Like, is there multiple groups in it? That is what clustering tries to answer. All right, so we have um, most of the framework done. We have a small set of models, which is the next thing I'll be working on is adding more models. We have some metrics of how to see how well the modeling went, the clustering went, which is awkward because we don't have a baseline. So it's really hard to say this clustering did well, but there's not a way of saying that it did it correctly. And even if you have a baseline, the method might find other things under the herd that play a different type of string. And then extractions and tuning. All of that you can find in the tidy class package. 
it is more self-contained because it we would have to rip out and rewrite so many things in the rest of the tidy model. So this is in many a way a like a parsnip cousin. So it doesn't rely on much as parsnip, it's more its own thing. Because the idea of an outcome is so essential to parsnip. All right. So what I do today, we need to do a couple of new things. We uh, remove the outcome because clustering models don't have outcomes. And then I'm just, for ease, I am just ignoring the serve variable by also dipping it an ID. And because some of these clustering models really care about normalized predictors, I'm also normalizing ordinary numeric predictors, which is basically everything. So now data looks like this for um, the clustering setting. And then it's just all like it's normalized because it needs to be normalized. So tidy class, as I said, is different than parsnip, but it's also the same because the word flow here looks exactly the same as what you saw in parsnip. The only difference is that you can't specify an outcome. But here I'm creating a k-means model, and I'm saying it needs to have four clusters. And I'm giving it an engine and I'm saying the mode here is partition because we're partitioning the data. And then you put it into a workflow and you fit it and it just works. All of this is uh, train ready. It's been working for a while now. Uh, available models in clustering, we have a k-means, which I have taken the liberty to encompass um, three different k something, so we can do k means, which is everything is numeric. We have k modes, which everything is not numeric, so everything is territorial. So the mean of the data is the mode of the most common value, that most common occurrence of a value. But in k modes requires everything to be nominal. So that is also kind of weird. Like, like that's not, you don't always have that. That's why K prototypes come in. Um, there's an engine that can handle that. So K prototypes is a, like is K means, but better because it now works with numeric variables and territorial variables at the same time. And we also have hierarchical clustering in there. The next release I'm doing, which I might start on this year, hopefully start on this year, will add more much more much more model types than these two. I think I have most of the, the framework down, the interface is working well. So next step is more models. If you have a specific one in mind, click the link in the footer and it should bring you to somewhere where you can get to post an issue on the tidy cluster. Uh, data page. So if you have a specific model you really want to use, put it in there and we'll see if we can make it happen. So once you have your, you fit your cluster model, you can do a couple of things. So there's three things that we allow you to do in tidy cluster. One of them is finally the cluster assignment. So when you do a normal partitioning, it's a way of taking your data set and splitting into something. We split into four, but as we said earlier, hey, give me four. Um, and it pulls it up. So we can say extract the cluster assignment. It takes the original data set and say which cluster where you assigned to. It, it's a little bit more tricky because what it does, if you ever fit a Tami model multiple times, you know that even though you get the same clusters, the cluster name is might be different because this is randomly assigned. So in the, first, there's not an ordering of clusters doesn't matter. There's not a left and a right and up and down more important. So they're just randomly assigned. So even though you have like three clusters, a like up, down, and left, they will have label one, two, three, randomly every time. We try to fit that 
So the way it happens is when you fit a model inside the cluster and it assigns each to a cluster, it then looks at the training data set and it says the cluster that is that the first observation is in will be called cluster one. And then it goes down and then once it sees a new a cluster that wasn't in cluster one, it says now that observation is in cluster two and we all say the finger then, and then it goes down. So when you load, so that means if we fit this model multiple times and the clusters appear in the same rotation, you always did the same ordering. It's still dependent on the ordering of the observations, but it's, it's one area where we're reducing the variability a little bit. We can also pull out the, the centroids. So this is the location of the, the set like the clusters in, and they are done at like a Euclidean distance center, whatever like this makes more sense. So these are like the rotations. If you did um, the a prototypes and you had had all the variables, the it would say like comedy, thriller, whatever, whatever the centroid would be located in the territorial. And we can also do prediction, which is controversial, but it's done in the setting of so in a T means setting and it's documented. You have one observation, it says it tells you the distance to all the centroids and says which one is closest to. So now if you give it a new data point, you technically use it to predict a new cluster if you want to or not. All right, and I tried to, so here I had two other data set, I fit everything on it, these are cluster assignments, and I put it in a U map with some variables. And it's like, it's not perfect because also U map isn't perfect, like not, nothing here is perfect, but, that does appear. And one thing you always find when you do like a U map, because technically there's a lot of territorial variables in this data set. So it's not that much continuous, they end up being blobs. But we might not be like, it might not be four clusters. That's like that's not necessarily a thing. But there might be a little bit of evidence that we that the Tamin's model is picking up on something. Yes, there are like that the UMAP is also picking up on this. They are not randomly styled, they are like something's happening, but then it's not perfect data. But in general, you can do all of this. We also have a couple of cluster aware metrics. So if you have a metric, some of these metrics is like the, like the sum of distances between the points and clusters. So you need to know this, where the points are and where the clusters are. But if you have that, then you can tell you these metrics. So we have a lot of these metrics included as well. And I didn't show it because it's um, it's fairly uh, self-explanatory. If you can use tune grid, change grid to cluster, and you can now fit multiple clustering models. Um, if you wanted to find out, fit multiple Tamin's models for various values of the number of clusters, you use the tune, set tune, the num plus e to tune, and we can then fit our multiple. All right. A couple of other uh, lightning round of new and upcoming things. We have the idea of ton formal inference. So it's basically another way of saying how to make prediction intervals with no parametric assumptions. So if you have a prediction, it has a value, but we also know there's some variability to it. So how can we find a, a interval around our prediction to say how likely it is, and what values to this prediction take? Matt's tune did a taught at the positive time, so that hopefully will be up soon. 
<laughs> uh, it's not tried on YouTube yet. It should be up there eventually. If you can't wait, there's a link to the talk material on GitHub. Where you can like, read the slides yourself. It used the properly package, and you also have a more in-depth article on the tidy models on uh, um, the website that kind of demonstrates how to do this. It's a very neat idea, and it's it's helpful. It, the non-parametric assumptions really help um, making this happen. It's fairly easy. It's a very it's very easy to do. Like it's one of those weird thoughts and things of, hey, we did a thing and you just need to write two, three lines and then you have it. Another thing is this idea of calibration, which is um, when you do the normal prediction model link, um, there are, you have three steps. So we have the pre-processing, which is all the recipes with the model fading, which you do in parsnip. And then the post-processing, which we haven't done a lot to deal with yet, but we are starting to dip our toes into it. So here properly is one of them. If you have a prediction model that predicts like the later the classification thing. So it gives you a, a likelihood that something is happening between one but zero percent and hundred percent. But your model never predicts like 10%. Right? It never predicts 80. It's always say like something is always between like 80 and 60 percent. It never ventures outside. It's probably because your model isn't calibrated well enough. And this is where properly has functions to help to do calibrations to um, make it so our predictions fit the whole interval of possible values. Another thing is also, this also in a very like indirect, it's, oh, I didn't spell it, it's torsional, in, but torsional inference, I hope I spelled it right. We would light more eyes on it. If this is something that you do or something you're interested in, Hit the link and like, there's a couple of things happening in there that might be of use. We talked to some people and definitely something we want a support in tidy models as a whole, but we haven't done a lot of, um, a lot of feedback around it. We would like to hear what people think. So here's a link to that. If you're interested to see it, coming soon. Uh, we are in the words of fairness as a whole thing, like fairness modeling. But what's coming soon, soon is a fairness metrics. So this is this idea of if you calculate the performance of your model, um, doing it all at once is not necessary. Like you lose things, so you might see. Um, but the performers might do really well on certain subsections of the population that you're working on rather than others. And how do you adjust that? How do you capture that? The fairness metrics, what we're doing is a new way of specifying performance metrics in a hopefully easy way to be able to pull out some of these informations. So you to say, Hey, I want to calculate the, the accuracy of this model across um, like neighborhoods. Like it's a certain neighborhoods this model doesn't work well in compared to others. This is what it's doing. That's like timing out soonish as well. It's a fairly, fairly minor change, but it still took. We spent a long time making sure we got this right. Another thing that I'm personally working, trying to work on finish this year is just the user niceness of we want to make sure that the errors that we send out and warnings and any kind of messaging that comes out is as good as possible. So I'm taking a, a overhaul to most of that in, in tidy models hoping we can get some nice errors out. So, but I like to think that we want to keep you programming on a happy path, which is when everything just works. 
But when you did an error, it's because something went wrong. And that error should be as clear as possible. So you know what to fit. So you fit, fit right away and come back to doing what you want to do. Instead of trying to go online, figure out what is happening. Why is this saying this? Error? So this is what I'm hoping to do, finish up this year. And it should be like a bunch of little, little niceties whenever you, when there was something you don't want to happen, happens. And that is all I have. If you want to learn off of new things, like I'm on social media, I try to post about our things. Um, other than that, we post on the Tidyverse blog about new things. We have a quarterly post as well that summarizes everything we did in the main, main points, what we did in the last three months, and other things will be interspersed. After we change the tidy models website to use Toro. It's now easy for us to add new uh, content. So we're also trying to post on the tidy models website as well more frequently. But yeah, that is that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much, Emil. This was great. I feel like I learned so many things. Um <clears throat> I'm super excited about especially some of the stuff that you mentioned that's in progress work around bringing ideas from causal inference into tidy models. And I've just started thinking a lot more around um, like fairness in machine learning and modeling and, and things like that. And so I'm super excited to hear about that work being done. I think that will be really interesting. And I didn't really know about some of the stuff that we had been talking about today. You know, I didn't realize um, kind of the uh, that you could do like clustering inside the the tidy models framework. That was new to me. So it was really cool to see that. And I think I'm just, um, you know, I'm so excited about how the tidy models brings this unified language to a lot of different modeling uh, paradigms. So I think that's really exciting. Thank you. I mean, we, like we, like I'm in a weird job because, like, I don't necessarily like to brag, but I need to. Whenever I do something, I need to tell it from the mountaintops because otherwise people don't use it. So it's like it's, I don't really like to like say, "Oh, I did this neat thing," but I need to because what I do only matters if people use it. And so, like, and this was a, a great venue of like just spitting out like these six things we've been doing the last like year or so I, I saw a lot of people loving the the step dummy there's another related one i want to just show because i wrote it at the same time step dummy because it's it's, this, it's a similar vibe of of data so there's also step move Step dummy multi choice. So, not great name, but if you ever had data that looked like this, oh. where it's like, it's, a, it's not quite time deliberated, like deliberated like before, but it's like, then like there's multiple languages here, but they're like listed separately. Mm -hmm. uh, step dummy multi choice will kind of do the same thing. So, here it like you say, specify all these like. Set all of them and then count across and then do the dummy variables as before. So then we have like the first one is English, Italian has the same idea. But this this is basically sorry, oops, copy that to chat. I find that it's essentially the same problem as the extract. It's just formatted differently in um in the data, and it's just hopefully and like it's not it's not a hard thing. Like it's it's just sometimes you have this data. It's like this is makes life just so easier pulling the information out in this way. One of the quotes from you that I have written down is that we want to keep your programming on a happy path. To me, that's so emblematic of the way that our programming and a lot of our programmers 
I think, create a, a really positive enthusiasm around our programming. Um, it's really nice and, and different from many other languages. I think there's a lot of focus on user friendliness in the R community. So it's very much appreciated. And I know that when I'm teaching like R to students, like people really appreciate um, the ways that the R community does that for them. Um, so I have that written down because I feel like I'm going to be repeating that to a couple of people. Um, and I, I, I didn't originate that. I saw that from yeah. someone. So it's like, Somewhere. I don't remember who, but there's someone at first that said that. That, that, that sounds answer. right. But uh, it's all right. Okay. So here, if you, if you ever see like an error that you don't like, or like something that like always like reach out to us because we want to, we want to improve as much as we can. Um, I was wondering, you know, how do you see like the all date predictors function was really interesting to me. And it reminds me of some of the syntax in dplyr where uh, I think Libby was mentioning in the chat just now, the new across syntax, you know, and you can say like across where is numeric or something. And I'm just thinking about like, how are you thinking about the difference between the syntax in like, I guess tidy select is is part of what's going on there. Um, mm -hmm. or, or maybe I'm wrong about that, but just the way that column selection works in, in something like dplyr versus how it works in the tidy models framework with these new functions like all date predictors. Yes, so it's a good question. So in recipe specifically, you can use, i would send a, a link in the chat. You can use all the dplyr selectors as well. Okay. Because they all under like dplyr uses tidy select. So you can use the start with uh, num range, but all like those like neat selectors, you can use as recipes as well. We have the benefit of variables in recipes having metadata. So we know it's a date because it's listed as that. You can also say, give me all the ID variables and it can give you all ID variables. So we have more information there, but yeah, in essence, the all date predictors underneath the hood, if you wanted to translate to like a dplyr specific, it would be uh, like a trust where is date. Yeah. And then you do something in that. But it, it, I, I like the syntax and you can combine them too. So you can say all date and matches like a name so like it it should work like the way you would expect but no i, I love the the dplyr way of specifying things because it's and especially in recipes because when we do things there's no guarantee that variable names exist later because they might have been transformed or removed so being able to specify by type is so important but otherwise, you couldn't use recipes because it's like, oh, it, I don't know what that tell them is told anymore. And you can just specify by, by thing. Very interesting. I just totally coincidentally, I, I mentioned to you um, before we started that I was sitting in another talk just before this, and they were actually talking about, you know, survival analysis concepts and ideas. And that, that was around some like COVID vaccine trials and thinking about, you know, some people get COVID. So we have this time to event of when did, you know, how many weeks or days until they got COVID and, and some people are censored, right? They never, never got COVID in those trials. Um, so I'm super curious, you know, I'll see, I guess I'll have to mess around to what extent do the the new ideas that I think are being developed over there in those talks and, and in these complicated like survival settings get translated into tidy models. I think it's super exciting to see the survival analysis stuff coming in. Um, I was wondering, is the, I, I have not seen the syntax, the pack function or pack package. Is that a way of installing like a developer version of a package? Do you know the remotes package? Yeah. 
Yeah. So pad is the newer version of that, essentially. Oh, so you can okay. say pad, well, pad, pad, it's a fun syntax, but you just give it a name, so pad is name, and it installs it. Right? But if you do the the GitHub, like name, pad, it? it installs the dev version, but you can also use, like, it installs from anywhere. So it can install from Bytelot, it can install from Tran, it can do GitHub, okay. but it, it is now like it works so well. And if you ever notice, sometimes if you install something big like tidy models, it yeah. sometimes takes minutes if you are like on a Windows machine or like a like non Linux. Because if you just used install packages, it installs them one by one. So it installs the first package and all of its dependencies. And then it does the next, pa next package and all of its dependencies and so on and so on. But in that approach, you end up installing the same packages multiple times, where a pad looks at everything and then finds out what needs to be installed all the way and then just installs all of that. And it has some caching too and other things. So it's much faster. It deals with, you don't run into issues as often with pad compared to remote or install packages. That's really cool. But it, it's uh, faster. Like it, it works. If you set it up, it's just faster than before. So that's that's great. Cool. No, it, it's awesome. Like it's so, it's so great. <laughs> I've had, yeah, I've had some really weird dependency install errors just a couple of times over the past several years where, you know, I'd try to install something and and it was clear that the issue was exactly what you were describing where it's like that some kind of issue with like the fact that the default behavior is to like install packages sequentially and sometimes packages are getting installed multiple times and then you know somewhere in that process something went wrong so maybe pack will prevent those issues in the future we we're slowly trying to like promote it more. It, it it should be in like all the I think we have it all the readmes on our packages now. So it's just slowly pushing it out to to the public. Well if there aren't any other questions, you're definitely welcome to ask. But um if there aren't, I think we can go ahead and wrap up. All right. Well Thank you so much for sharing your time with us, sharing your knowledge. It's been really great. I feel like I've learned a ton. So I'm looking forward to the next time I hear you speak, maybe somewhere else, maybe eventually in the future again on a different topic here. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure being here with all of you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Bye.